You know, when things are translated into music, events are translated into music, they become like pop culture. If you wouldn't mind, I will sing you one of the songs of Mary that are translated into our local mother tongue. Is that okay? Is the message about Our Lady of Fatima. And we knew that song as kids, and now it's still there. We sing it. At my private time, I sing it. Don't worry about the words I will translate. No Bodo Fatima, na 1917. Eze Osi ha bebe bere, osi ha mebo pipia, osi ha bebe bere makan jonku wa, oti to diri yesu nandwe bebe, amen. Ti to diri yesu nandwe bebe, amen. Umu Mary, oh, Ani Nelota, na Jesus Christ, Arugo Rebubea. You can hear Fatima. <laughs> it became part of our culture. We sing the Fatima message. We sing the message of the angel, the pr angelic prayer, the prayer of pardon. We sing all those events, and it becomes part of our experience. I grew up in a culture, I grew up in a family, a Catholic family, where I was immersed in the spirituality of Mary, and also in the spirituality of the Eucharist and the Holy Spirit. But first, with Mother Mary, the first prayer I ever said was in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary. I learned how to say the Hail Mary, and the first time I said a prayer for a long time was the chaplet. The chaplet, 15 minutes, the first five decades, and then the more Mother Mary was teaching me the mysteries of the faith. She was introducing me to, G to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was introducing me to Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. That's why I've said it before that the three foundations of my own spiritual life, one is Mary. It started with Mary. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. Marian, pneumatological and Christocentric in the theology of the Eucharistic spirituality. Because Mary is the mother. Mary is related to the sacrament, the most blessed sacrament. That's why we know that the best theology or explanation or name given to Mother Mary, other than the Theotokos, the mother of God, is the mother of the Eucharist. And you remember, the 13th day of May, what's the feast that day? What's the feast that the church celebrates? The 13th day of May, the day Mother Mary chose to appear the first time in 1917 was the feast. It is the feast of Mary of the Eucharist. Figure it out, the connection. So I grew in that. And the more I grew, I realized that more time I gave to Jesus through Mary, our mother, the better I became. You know, sometimes I hear people say, we are too busy to pray. When you are too busy to pray, you are busier than God wants you to be. I remember, I think about four years ago or five years ago, when I called Father Mitch Pakua, I was done with 
writing the manuscript for one of my books, and I said, Father, would you mind if help me with reviewing it and making some comments? I know you are a very busy man, about the most busy person I have ever met. He said, Father Morris, let me tell you. If you want things to be done, send it to people who are busy because they get things done. Send it here in three days, and I will send it back to you a week after. Sure enough, I did. A week after he sent it back. I learned one secret from that. Remember yesterday when he was talking to us about praying 15 decades every day? Some people who are less busy can't even say the one decade. In my own personal life, I realized that when it was getting more busy, God said, give me more time to pray, and I will multiply the productivity of your hands. That more time, he wasn't asking me, and I'm sharing a, person, a little personal thing about me right now. It wasn't just about one hour. The closer I, get to, I got to Mother Mary, I realized that Mother Mary was demanding more time of prayer. Five decades, 10, 15, and when they added the, the fourth one, 20. Guess what? As a child, I remember. When I locked myself in the room because Mother Mary wanted it, the whole day praying 200 decades of the rosary, it blew my mind away. It changed me forever. There is power in that rosary. There is power in reciting the history of our salvation. The more time we give to Mother Mary, the better we become because we get more connected to the source of our salvation, to the source of our redemption. Mary knows how to do it. If you were to play the lottery and they gave you the winning number, would you hesitate from buying it? Would you? We have the winning number. The winning number to peace in the world. The winning number to the peace we long for. Look around us as we see the challenges of our time, the polarizing nature of the political discourse, the polarizing nature of our relationships that have become more and more less of peace. And Mother gives us the key. The key, the winning number. And that's what we are called to do, to pray it. It is simple. It doesn't take more hours, 15 minutes. It changes everything. And for those who still marvel and wonder why the message of Fatima, why not a different message? Somebody was telling me, well, when I hear about the message of Fatima, it reminds me of terror, of sad, gloomy, long-faced messages of hellfire and brimstone. We are tired of the gospel of hellfire and brimstone. Talk about the gospel of good love. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk about the gospel of good, nice, nice. That's what I'm going to talk about. The gospel of good, nice, nice is this. Hell is for real. <laughs> and much more, heaven is for real. <laughs> and that message of Pharma was a message, a response to the cries of God's children. On the 5th of May, 1917, at the heat of that first world war, Pope Benedict XV called the church 
to prayer. That was when he introduced in the Loreto Litany, the Litany of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary, Queen of Peace, pray for us. That's when he introduced that in the Litany. Because he saw the destruction in the world, the hate, the violence, and much more the Freemason movement and their campaign for anti-God, anti-church, even in, on the streets of Rome. Remember, it was around the period when Maximilian Kobe was in Rome and he saw Lucifer promoted, inspired by Mother Mary, he called a few of the friars and said, let us band together as soldiers, as soldiers of the immaculate heart of Mary and the sacred heart of Jesus. He formed the order of the Immaculata Militia, Militia Immaculata, and that we are not going to use the sword or artillery or bomb or things of violence, but we have to use the tool of prayer to win the soul of the world. Because as Pope Benedict the 15th said, we are waging a battle to win back the soul of Europe. That was his expression. So that was when Pope Benedict the 15th called the church for the novena to Our Lady, Queen of Peace. That Mother Mary will intervene and change the hearts of men and women all over the world so that we can love and grow in the knowledge and love of God. Did Mother Mary answer that prayer? Remember May 5th, 1917. Day one, day two, Sure, Mary did. By the eighth day, boom, the apparition. Mother Mary always says yes. Yes to the pleas of the children. Yes to the pleas of those broken hearts. Yes to our concerns because our concerns are her concerns. She did. This is part of the background for Fatima. The forces of government were driving away God and the church well before the World War began. World War I was sort of sparked by the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand of Aust Austria and his wife Sophia. But it was a spark that was set off in an enormous powder room. Europe had been increasingly focusing on their empires, their power, their nations. They were pushing the church farther and farther away. The French Third Republic kicked the priests and nuns out of France. And people were talking about war after the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Pope Pius X was begging people in Europe, don't do this. Work on bringing peace. But the Pope was irrelevant to their secular mentality. He doesn't understand anything. And they would not listen. And even after, and he died just two weeks after the war began, on July 28th, 1914. He died uh, about three weeks later, August 20th. And his successor, Benedict XV, was begging the people of Europe to stop the war. And they got literally entrenched. They did trench warfare, and so many died. And new weapons, like gas and such, were used. He decried, Europe 
is committing suicide. Without God, they didn't know what to live for. And they were even using ideas from Darwin. They were saying in the media, look, a lot of people are dying, but that's okay. Because the war is going to show the survival of the fittest. The ones who died were not the fittest. Therefore, it's okay if they're gone. And that's a good thing for evolution. That's what they were saying about the war. And it's very interesting that in 1915, Pope Benedict ordered all the churches to pray for, to the Sacred Heart for peace. Germany, France, and Spain refused to, pay, to pray for peace. They absolutely refused and would not allow the prayers to go on when people gather for prayers for peace. That's why it was in 1916 that the angel of peace was sent to Fatima to teach the children to pray. He was sent there to teach them, especially that great prayer, my God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I ask pardon of you for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. And they felt that strong sense of God's presence. And then it is 1917, the following year after that apparition, a few months later. 1917 was the 200th anniversary of the founding of the first Masonic Lodge in England. It had begun in England in 1717. And in fact, Masonic promoters had taken over Mexico and started a war against Catholics in Mexico. The Crucero Wars, in which the Masons not only forbade mass from being said, they would not even allow wine to be sold anywhere in Mexico to make sure that nobody could say mass. At least they knew that much theology that you had to have wine to celebrate mass. They just abused the little that they knew. Mas Masonic leaders had also taken over Portugal and a number of other places. And now we see that on May 5th of 1917, Pope Benedict added to the litany of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Queen of Peace, pray for us. That's when he put it in there, to pray for an end of World War I. And he started a novena to Our Lady of Peace to bring an end. And then eight days later, on the 13th, is when Our Lady appeared to the children at Fatima. It's hard not to see it as a response to the Pope's prayer that Our Lady, Queen of Peace, would help Europe and the world. She appears not to him or any other priest, but to these children. Of course, she appeared repeatedly. The first time, she speaks to them with a question, asks the children, a, a question that could be addressed to each one of us today. Because we certainly are inheriting a lot of problems that have been percolating for a while. We're certainly seeing lots of tension 
in our country that's even different from the 60s. There's more tension and anger at one another in this country than we've seen since the 60s and perhaps a little bit more intense than it was in the 60s. But she asks the question, and each one of us needs to be able to answer it. Are you willing to offer yourselves to God and bear all the sufferings he wills to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and for supplication for the conversion of sinners. She doesn't say, you got to do this. She asks them, just as the angel Gabriel had asked her to be the mother of her Lord. So also she asks the children, and we should really hear it being addressed to us, are you willing to offer yourself something each one of us can and ought to do every time we go to Mass at the offertory, offer ourselves with the bread and the wine, so that when Christ transforms the bread and wine at the consecration and transubstantiates it into his body and blood, so also he might take our offering of ourselves and transform it to him, to unite our self-offering with his offering on the cross always remembering something that so many have forgotten, neglected, or even consciously rejected, that the Mass is primarily the unbloody sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is the main issue in the Mass. People try to turn it into being about us, being in community together, feeling a bond, which is a good thing. I'm not against that. But the bond that we have exists only because we offer ourselves to God through Jesus Christ by union with his saving death. And we enter into that not only once at our baptism, but at every single mass that we participate in. And that's why I'm against songs that celebrate how great we are. We have so many new hymns that are saying, we're the people of God, we're the light of the world, we're building the kingdom of God, gather us here, bring us here, it's all about us. Basically telling God, hey, God, do you realize how lucky you are to have me in this church? Listen up! I don't like those hymns. I want the hymns to praise God and adore Him. To realize how great Thou art as a fine Protestant hymn sings, and to have a sense of adoration and more profoundly offering of ourselves. Our Lady asked that. And they said yes. And they suffered lots of issues. It was not easy for those kids. Oh, we, we see the Blessed Mother, so we're really great, aren't we? No, we're in trouble. Lucia's mother didn't believe her, and her mother was very much a believer. Her mother was a catechist, very committed Catholic, but she just didn't believe that it was true. She thought the kids were making this up, and that they were, and so she had to deal with that. And then each month on the 13th, more people came. In fact, in June, 50 people showed up. In July, 
4,000 people. And then in August, the government of Portugal was really scared of this. They wanted to put a stop to it. They first took them for a carriage ride, gave them a really fancy dinner and said, now just stop talking about this and we'll keep taking good care of you. He said, no, we got to go see the lady. And then they turned on a dime. After promising them all sorts of great things, they turned on a dime and said, uh, it threatened them with execution, torture, put them in jail with criminals. And when they put them in jail with the criminals, the kids told them why they were in jail, and the criminals started saying the rosary with them. This is something that we have to learn from these kids. They were not snowflakes. These kids were taught by Our Lady to say the rosary every day. That's what she had said in Jul July apparition. To say the rosary every day for peace. Because you weren't going to get it from the politicians. Surprise, surprise, Sergeant. <laughs> and so they even taught the prisoners. And eventually the People were getting pretty mad that they'd been kidnapped by their government. And so they were let go a few days later, and then Our Lady appeared to them a few days later on the 19th of August. On the th uh, September 13th, 25,000 people showed up. And then for the October manifestation, it was 55,000 plus another 20,000 in the area. Do you know the uh, actor uh, Martin Sheen? He's been on television, done a lot of movies and such. He said that, he told me once, ha that his father had seen the miracle of the sun. His father was living in Spain. That's where his father was from. His father was from Spain, and he saw the miracle of the sun as well, far away. It wasn't some group psychology or hypnosis or anything like that. It was a real event. And the children did go through difficulties and suffering, and they accepted it. They knew it, they accepted that invitation, and they lived it. And I've already heard from quite a number of you that Catholic teaching is not always so welcome. There are a lot of people who object. Did we not just see Senator Feinstein going after a candidate for a judgeship, asking her if her Catholic faith would interfere with the way she prosecutes the law, would you do that to a Jewish candidate? Would you do that to a Muslim candidate? And Senator Franken joined in on it. No, he was supporting Feinstein on that issue. Is it getting to a point that the left-wing politicians in this country are becoming like the know-nothings who were anti-Catholics in the early 1800s? Or the Ku Klux Klan that was anti-Catholic in the late 1800s and into the 1900s? Are these so-called liberals and progressives imitating those who were authoritarian and dictatorial and terrorist like the Ku Klux Klan was? 
After all, they still support Planned Parenthood that was founded by a woman who not only spoke five different times, Margaret Sanger spoke five times to the Ku Klux Klan meetings, but she said to them and to, in her books, black people are a weed that must be eliminated. And they support her and they supported Planned Parenthood. We, on the other hand, have to pay attention to any of this rise of anti-Catholicism and speak up against it with more clear Catholic thought and with greater morals and ethics than you would find in those who attack us. This is going to be our answer. And we'll stand up and we'll be willing to offer ourselves for the sake of doing something more ethical and more moral, more right. And we are going to begin that by paying attention to Our Lady's requests, not only to offer ourselves, but to pray every day the rosary, not to miss it, ever. Always to say our rosary for peace. We want peace with those people who are calling themselves Intifa or Antifa, whatever they are, the anti-fascists. We don't want fascists. We have to pray for the racists. But we don't pray that they resolve their issues by bashing each other. We pray for a peace inside their heart that racists overcome the idiocy of racism and its evil. And that the Antifa people or whoever else is causing difficulties would come to see the dignity of the people that they don't agree with. You don't simply go there to shut down your opponents, but to bring them to a conversion to the truth about God and the truth about being humans with a dignity that is not given to us by the state and therefore cannot be removed by the state. It is not given us by a political party and cannot be removed by a political party. But as our Declaration of Independence says, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is given to us by the Creator. And it is that in the same declaration the same declaration in its concluding paragraph, which all of us should read more of, it also recognizes that we will proceed by God's providence, but we will be judged by God, not by political success or failure. And as a result, our conversion by praying for peace that is with the inherent dignity of every single person. The peace that comes to us from God as much as our rights and dignity come from God. That as we pray the rosary every day for that, we pray that we can avoid the mistakes that came by the failures to listen to the message of Fatima. It was just a few weeks later that 
the Bolsheviks, only 45,000 Bolsheviks in all of Russia took over the country because the people were so afraid of them, they would not defend themselves against them, and they terrorized folks, and they took over the country with 45,000 and began a persecution that led to the killing of 61.9 million of their own citizens for the rest of the century, from 1917 forward. They were afraid. We're not. We trust in God. We accept the program that Our Lady gives us. And we trust that it will undo the atheism and the rejection of God and faith and the church and the sacraments that so dominate our culture today as it has since the time of the Enlightenment. It doesn't have to stay that way. Don't think that it can't reverse. They, in their silliness, think that it's all evolution, we're going to stay that way. No. God is still stronger than what they think is progress. And he'll use each one of us in our weakness in order for us to find his strength. As Mother Angelica said, God asks us to do the ridiculous so he can do the miraculous. Thank you. I just want to talk briefly about six anniversaries. The first of which is about a week and a half ago, my wife and I had our 31st wedding anniversary. When we got married, we were in our early 30s. I was a young pastor. When she tells her conversion story, the title of it is, I didn't want to be a pastor's wife anyway. And so I'm learning to be a pastor at the same time she's learning to be a pastor's wife, and it was tough. It was tough enough, and I'm telling you, the last thing we ever dreamed was that we'd be Catholic someday, let alone just try and be a good, faithful pastor's husband and wife. There she is. <laughs> Definitely my better half. And so we embarked on the journey of being a pastor and his wife and having children. And that was 31 years ago. And <clears throat> the blessing is that at the same time, I, be, by grace, began to be open to the Catholic faith. So was she. What opened my heart was the conviction I had as I stood before my congregation every Sunday knowing that I was responsible before God for the truth that I gave to those people because their eternity was dependent on what I'm teaching. It's still their choice, but I've got to be teaching them what's true. And it began to trouble me over the years that why was my particular Presbyterian perspective we believed in Jesus and Scripture, but I couldn't agree with what the Methodist or the Baptist or the Assembly of God or the Lutheran, Episcopalian, the Catholic, or other Presbyterians agreed on. There was a one thing we all agreed on. What's wrong with this picture? And I wasn't sure what the answer was. I assumed it was me. Maybe I'm the problem. It can't be Jesus. It can't be the Scriptures. But in time, the Lord drew me to discover the beauty of the Catholic Church. At the same time, my wife was discovering it in a totally different way. She was the director of a crisis pregnancy center. And so guess who she's spending a lot of time with? <laughs> Catholics. And so the Lord drew us side by side to discover the beauty of the church until we, dis we, we approach the second anniversary, which I want to mention, and that is that 25 years ago, she and I 
entered the Catholic Church. We, I tell you what, we, we don't pat ourselves on the back for that. We recognize it was totally a gift of grace. And I mean that in all sincerity. I, I've done how many interviews with, with uh, men and women who've come into the church, and I can tell you to, to the last one, not a one of them would say it was their great intellect. They would all recognize it was the mercy of God, which is why when we look at our separated brethren who don't seem to be open at all to the Catholic Church, it isn't merely that they're stubborn or, or they haven't read enough. I mean, that's all a part of it, but it still comes down to the mystery of God's grace. And so that's why the most important thing we can do for anyone to draw them closer to our faith is to be praying for them all the time, that grace would open their hearts and minds. It's the most important thing. And one of the struggles we had in our journey was that we we didn't know very many others making the same journey. Before I met my old classmate from seminary, Scott Hahn, after he'd become Catholic, and he had a lot to do with our coming into the church, I knew him when we were friends in seminary, and, we, and he was as avid a Calvinist as he is now a Catholic. But before I heard that he had become Catholic, I had never heard of another Protestant minister ever becoming Catholic, never. And then when we, Scott and I be, became reacquainted and we began meeting others on the journey, and when we came into the church, our experience was that we were learning of more and more Protestant ministers on the journey to the church with the same experience that we had. When we were coming into the church, we had almost no one to talk to. We couldn't talk to our Protestant friends about Catholic things. That was always a battle. And we didn't know very many Catholics, and many of the Catholics, Catholics we knew couldn't explain their faith very well. Plus, we would meet Catholics that would say, well, you know, since Vatican II, you don't have to convert. Just stay where you are. And so we were very much alone. And so when we came into the church, we saw the need for a support group. Imagine a 55-year-old man who's never done anything but ministry, married with kids, and he's going to quit his ministry to become Catholic. What's he going to do? And that's what the Coming Home Network is there to help. And so back in 1996, as Peter mentioned, I had a great invitation to join Mother Angelica to talk on her program about the Coming Home Network. And I was there with Dr. Kenneth Howell, a good friend, also a convert to the church. And we talked about our journey into the church. <clears throat> and during that program, Mother says, you know, you need to come back. And I thought she meant on another live show. And then within a month, I got this call from Doug Keck, and they want to do a program with converts. Mother's reason was, of all the Catholics who are disturbed about their siblings and children who've left the church, if they could hear the story of a convert every week, it would give them hope that their own children might come home. <laughs> Boy, if that person could come back, maybe my son Bill or my daughter Sue. The other reason she wanted it was because there were so many Catholics that took our faith for granted. And she thought that by hearing these convicted converts, well, they aren't convicted yet. They haven't done anything wrong. But uh, <laughs> explaining their faith with great energy that it would help Catholics appreciate this great gift we've always had, right? Does that help? Does that work? Now, my reason for doing the journey home is I wanted our separated brethren to hear it. So every time I prepare one of my guests, I want to make, sh I, I said, you've got to make sure that when you're talking your story, you've got to make sure you tell how much you love Jesus. Because if our separated brethren don't hear you talk about Jesus, they'll say, well, if they knew Jesus, they wouldn't be Catholic. <laughs> they, they don't know us. Do you understand? They don't know us. But there are three other anniversaries that I want to mention. Those are the three that are more about my own journey. And there are three anniversaries that I want to just talk briefly about. And the next, of course, is 100 years ago, Our Lady appeared to these three children at Fatima. And we've been talking about that all weekend. It came at a difficult time, as Father Pack was said. And these were three simple children, and Our Lady appeared. And <clears throat> there are two statements that Our Lady made to the children that in my mind 
at least summarize simply five important things about Fatima. <clears throat> the first statement she said on her last appearance on October 12th, she said, I am Our Lady of the Rosary. I have come to exhort the faithful to change their lives and to stop offending the Lord by their sins. He is already too much offended. And then earlier on the first appearance, she said to Lucia, will you bear all the reparation for the sins by which he is offended? Will you pray for the conversion of sinners? So it seems to me there are five, and I'll add a sixth, but there are five key themes of Fatima that I think apply to us. And they've been said many times this weekend. And the five are prayer, repentance, conversion, holiness, and suffering. Now think about those five things in our lives. These aren't options. These are necessities. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 8 that we are, we call God Abba. We're his children. We experience, we inherit with Christ provided we suffer. Provided. Somehow in the mystery of, of God's plan for you and I, he calls us to accept suffering for the sake of others. So we pray for the sake of others. We repent for our sinfulness, which has so offended. That word offending God just troubles me. Think about what offends you. Could it be something gross or something just horrible? God's offended by our sins. So we are to repent. Conversion, turning from what we were to what he calls us to be. And that calling is holiness, so we can stand before God without embarrassment. And a part of that involves suffering. In, in John chapter 15, when our Lord talks about vine and the branches, and he talks about, I am the vine, you are the branches, and he talks about the necessity of us to being pruned. Remember that little phrase? If we don't produce fruit, we're cast away like a, a dead branch. But if we produce fruit, then we're pruned. It's like, wait a second. I just produced fruit. You should be pleased. So why are you cutting me back? So we can produce better fruit, more virtuous fruit. Fruit not for us, but for others. To me, the theme of Fatima, just for a second, simply is prayer, repentance, conversion, holiness, suffering, and then one more thing, of course, Our Lady. Our Lady. We, we almost, I almost get the sense we take her for granted. She was a part of, she's all the Fatima is, drawing our attention to Jesus. Praying the rosary, her immaculate heart, the first Saturdays, devotion, but recognizing her love for us and how she draws us to her son. The fifth anniversary that I want to briefly mention also happens this year, and it's been mentioned this weekend, and that is that next month, October 31st is the 500th anniversary of the start of the Protestant Reformation. Now on that day, 500 years ago, a priest by the name of Father Martin Luther posted 95 debate questions. And we've learned and the church has very humbly recognized that there's more than enough guilt to go around. We're not just pointing fingers anymore at Martin Luther or Lutherans or John Calvin and Calvinists. Uh, I remember an old pastor saying, you know, when you point a finger, you got three pointing back at yourself. And so we've learned in, hu in humility, and St. John Paul II was very clear about this, is that mea culpa for what was our part of the Reformation. But the only thing I want to mention in the brief time I have about the Reformation is that think about those six things. And the problem is that when the, the authority of the church was set aside at the Reformation and the trustworthiness of tradition was set aside, leaving the Bible alone, 
you recognize now that amongst our separated brethren, there is complete diversity when it comes to all those six things. Prayer, repentance, is it necessary amongst our separated brethren? They have different views on sin, repentance. Conversion, I know friends, in fact, I was one of those health and, or um, no, I wasn't health and wealth gospel. I was a once saved, always saved preacher. Once you accepted Jesus, you're saved. And like Luther said, he could sin a thousand times a day and it wouldn't make a difference to his salvation. So why repent? What about sin anymore? What about conversion anymore? What about holiness? What about suffering? Before I was a Catholic, not one time did I ever even think about redemptive suffering. I never, it wasn't a concept we never thought about. Suffering was only something to avoid. And Our Lady, our separated brethren, don't understand or accept her. Now, they're, they're our brothers and sisters, so we pray and love them. And our goal is to help them discover the, the beauty of our faith. But my point is that in that anniversary, all six of those things became confusion and division. There's no agreement on how to pray. There's no agreement on the necessity of repentance. There's no agreement on the necessity of conversion. There's no agreement on the necessity of holiness. There's no agreement on suffering whether it makes any difference, whether it's helpful, whether it's necessary, and there certainly is no agreement on Our Lady. The sixth anniversary I want to mention is one that it's possible no one in this room has ever thought about. But it's happening as we are sitting here. From Luke, chapter 2, 51, 52. You recognize this verse it is the close of the story about the finding of Jesus in the temple. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them, and his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So he's about 12 years old. He's off there in the temple. Remember, he's teaching. Mother and father find him and bring him back, and he, in obedience, goes back home with them. The next time we hear about Jesus is in Luke 3, after John has been about 20 years later baptizing, and we hear this statement now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened. You realize that between those two verses are about 20 years? Those are called the silent years of Jesus. The silent years. We know almost nothing about those silent years. We know he was in obedience to his mother and father. We know he grew in wisdom as a normal human would grow. His human side, I mean, he's divine and human, the mystery of that, but as human matures, we know that. We also know that during that time, he apprenticed with his carpenter father. He had a reputation for that. And we also are pretty sure that sometime in those 20 some years, his father died. Because when we come out of that silent period, all we hear about are Mary, his mother, and his cousins. 2,000 years ago, this happened. This is the 2,000th anniversary, think about it, of the silent years of Jesus. So he might have been 17, 18. We don't know. It's about that time period. Why is this important? It says in Hebrews that our Lord Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, but what? Without sin. In his humanity, in his teen years, his adolescence, his young adult years. During the time he was trying to, he was learning to understand what it meant he came for. I mean, we always believe that, he, of course, he knew who he was and what he was called for. But the realization of that in his humanity that's what the silent years were. In other words, it was a time of him discerning and understanding his calling because when he comes out of those silent years, what does he do? He gets baptized. And now he's looking forward to what? A cross. A cross. Now, sin is a thread that ties all of those things together. 
And in Fatima, maybe the most clear message is that our sin was offensive to our God. John the Apostle wrote in his letter that he said, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. His word isn't in us. That word that, that applies this addition of this idea of Christ abiding in us by his word and his love. And when we sin and we deny our sin, we cast him out. We cast him out. To me, the message of all six of those anniversaries is the need for our turning from sin to holiness in our marriages, in our relationships, in our journey of faith, our conversion, in our witness. What kind of a witness is our life? When I think of Fatima, I think about how the angels, the saints, and Our Lady are there to strengthen and pray for and encourage us. In Fatima, we were encouraged to do something every day. What was that? Pray the rosary. What do we say 53 times in the rosary? And what's the ending of that? What are we praying? Help me, my sins. Help me. Help me. Help me. I don't want to offend God. I don't want to offend God. Help me. The need to turn from sin. And often that, like John was trying to talk about there, is people need to be awakened to their sin because we live in a soup in which we don't think we're sinners. We're as good as the next guy. Lord, awaken me so that I can stand before you without embarrassment. There's a verse in Hebrews chapter 12 that I think is, I didn't see as a Protestant because holiness was not a big part of my particular Protestant theology. But the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, strive for peace with all men and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Of course, our Lord, said that, our Lord said that in the Sermon on the Mount. Be perfect as your heavenly Father. Well, how can I do this? I'm a failure. Mary, pray for us. Our Lord, forgive us. Give us the grace and the strength we need to move forward. 